Brothers Gaming. Today we will talk about Pac-Man. In 1982, Atari released their version of Namco's hit arcade game Pac-Man for its Atari 2600 video game console. Like the original arcade version, the player controls the title character with a joystick. The objective is to traverse a maze, consuming all wafers within it while avoiding four ghosts. The game was programmed by Todd Fry. The technical differences between the Atari 2600 console and the original's arcade hardware particularly the amount of available memory presented several challenges. Given the popularity of the property, Atari produced about 12 million units which was more than the estimated number of Atari 2600 consoles sold at the time, anticipating high sales. It is the best-selling Atari 2600 game of all time. It sold an estimated 7 million copies, and was the best-selling home video game of all time when it was released. However, critics have considered it among the worst video games of all time, criticizing its controls and visuals. Initially, the port boosted the video game industry's presence in retail. It was followed by Atari 2600 ports of Pac-Man's arcade sequels. Now let's look at its gameplay. Pac-Man is a variation of the original arcade game, which Namco released in 1980, and features similar, but not identical gameplay. The player uses a joystick to control Pac-Man, navigating him through a maze of consumable dashes called video wafers, opposed by a quartet of multicolored ghosts. The goal of the game is to consume all the wafers in each level in order to proceed to the next one in search of the highest possible score. The four ghosts roam the maze, trying to kill Pac-Man. If any of the ghosts touches Pac-Man, he loses a life. When all lives have been lost, the game ends. Each game starts with four lives, and the player is awarded a bonus life upon successful completion of each level, up to a maximum of nine lives in reserve at any given time. Near the corners of the maze are four larger, flashing consumables known as power pills that provide Pac-Man with the temporary ability to eat the ghosts and earn bonus points. When a power pill is in effect the enemies turn blue and try to evade Pac-Man. When a ghost is eaten its disembodied eyes return to the nest that is the center box to respawn. The blue ghosts turn reddish during the last moments of a power pill's effect, signaling that they are about to become dangerous again, and the length of time for which the enemies remain vulnerable varies from one level to the next, becoming shorter as the game progresses. The final consumable items are the vitamins, which appear periodically directly below the nest. The game has eight variations, offering two different starting speeds for Pac-Man and four different starting speeds for the ghosts. The ghosts get slightly faster each subsequent round, but Pac-Man stays at the same speed. The consoles are, B difficulty switches can also be used to handicap one or both players. In the A that is the hard position, the power pills effects do not last as long. So what are the differences from the original? Overall the game follows the format of the original, but it differs in a number of key respects, including a landscape orientation of the screen, that the wraparound warp tunnel is located at the top and bottom as opposed to the sides. The maze layout and overall color scheme also differ from the original. Pac-Man himself features an eye and he only faces left and right, never turning to face up or down when traveling in those directions. The ghost size constantly cycle through four directions rather than being fixed in their current direction of travel. The maze contains 126 wafers, just over half of the arcade's 244 dots. The nest from which the ghosts emerge has its entrance on its right side instead of the top and the arcade's eight distinct and different valued bonus items that are mostly fruits are replaced by the nondescript single value vitamin. Ghost behaviors are different from the original and dispense with the brief rest states whereby the ghosts periodically do not track Pac-Man, but each ghost still features a distinct individual method of tracking Pac-Man, with one pair being smarter in their pursuit choices, 
and one member of each pair being faster than the other. In the arcade when a ghost is eaten its eyes return to the nest and it respawns and exits immediately in its normal and not vulnerable state, but in this version the eyes remain in the nest until any power pill effects expire before they respawn and re-emerge. The scoring for the home version is proportionally identical to the original except that each item is worth one tenth its arcade value, with the bonus vitamins as the only variation, being worth 100 points, which is the equivalent of the 1000 point scoring melon bonus item that appears in the 7th and 8th levels of the arcade game. Unlike the arcade version, if Pac-Man loses a life while the vitamin appears, the vitamin may not necessarily be forfeited. This version does not feature the marquee screen and interstitial animations. Neither does it attempt to approximate the sounds of the original, reducing the iconic two-note wacka wacka dot eating and bonus gobbling sounds to a single tone clank sound and single beep respectively, replacing the game start tune with a touch tone phone sounding four note motif and dispensing entirely with both the slot machine jackpot type sound signifying earning an extra life and the omnipresent siren sound during gameplay. The most significant and obvious difference is the constant flicker of the ghosts. So let's talk about how its development has been done. In the late 1970s, Atari acquired the rights to produce home versions of Namco's arcade games. After Pac-Man proved to be a success in the United States, Atari decided to produce the game for its Atari 2600 console. The company believed the conversion would be simple because the arcade's success was attributed to the gameplay rather than impressive visuals. Development took around four months, the process started in May 1981 and finished in September. At the time, Atari projected 10 million consoles were still actively used by video game enthusiasts. Atari decided to produce 12 million game cartridges, anticipating every Atari 2600 owner would purchase the game, while 2 million new customers would purchase the system to play it, management predicted sales would reach at least 500 million US dollars. Programming was assigned to Todd Fry, who was not provided with any arcade design specifications to work from, and had to figure out how the game worked by playing it. He spent 80 hour weeks over 6 months developing it. The finished game uses a 4 kilobyte ROM cartridge, chosen for its lower manufacturing costs compared to 8 kilobyte bank switched cartridges, which recently become available. As with any contemporary arcade port, the simple Atari 2600 hardware was a considerable limitation. The arcade Pac-Man system board contained 2 kilobyte of main RAM which to run the program, 2 kilobyte of video RAM to store the screen state, and 16 kilobyte of ROM to store the game code, whereas the Atari 2600 featured only 128 bytes of RAM memory and none dedicated to video, effectively 32 times less RAM. The Zilog Z80 CPU microprocessor used by the Namco Pac-Man arcade system is clocked at three times the speed of the MOS6507 CPU in the Atari 2600, but the instruction sets and architecture for each processor are very different, and a 6507 can do more operations per clock cycle, effectively 2 to 1 making one-to-one -one comparisons more difficult than simply comparing clock speed. To deal with these limitations, Fry simplified the maze's intricate pattern of corridors to a more repetitive pattern. The small tan pellets in the arcade original were changed to rectangular wafers that shared the wall color on the 2600, a change necessitated because both the pellets and walls were drawn with the 2600 playfield graphics, which are the fixed width. To achieve the visual effect of wafers disappearing as Pac-Man eats them, the actual map of the maze was updated as the data was written into the playfield registers, excluding those pellets that had been eaten. The 2600 player missile graphics system, sprites, were used for the remaining objects. The one-bit wide missiles were used to render the flashing power pills and the center of the vitamin. Pac-Man and Ghost characters were implemented using the 2600 two-player objects, 
with one being used for Pac-Man and the other being used for all four ghosts, with the result that each ghost only appears once out of every four frames, which creates a flickering effect. This effect takes advantage of the slow phosphorescent fade of CRT monitors and the concept of persistence of vision, resulting in the image appearing to linger on screen longer, but the flickering remains noticeable, and makes each individual ghost's color nearly impossible to discern. Fry chose to abandon plans for a flicker management system to minimize the flashing in part because Atari didn't seem to care about that issue in its zeal to have the game released. His game also did not conform to the arcade game's color scheme in order to comply with Atari's official home product policy that only space-type games should feature black backgrounds. Another quality impact was his decision that two-player gameplay was important, which meant that the 23 bytes required to store the current difficulty, state of the dots on the current maze, remaining lives, and score had to be doubled for a second player consuming 46 of the 2600 mega 128 byte memory, which precluded its use for additional game data and features. Often repeated stories claim that the company wanted to or did release a prototype in order to capitalize on the 1981 holiday season, but this is incorrect. The released game was a final product. Fry states that there were no negative comments within Atari about these elements, but, after seeing the game, Coin Division marketing manager Frank Balouz reportedly informed Ray Kassa, Atari's president and CEO that he felt enthusiasts would not want to play it. His opinion, however, was dismissed. The company ran newspaper ads and promoted the product in catalogs, describing it as differing slightly from the original. To help sales, Atari promoted and protected its exclusive licensing of Pac-Man. It took legal action against companies that released clones similar to Pac-Man. Atari sued Philips for its 1981 Magnavox Odyssey game Munchkin and obtained a preliminary injunction against the company to prevent the sale of Munchkin cartridges, but failed to stop other games, such as online systems Jawbreaker and Gobbler. Several retailers assisted Atari with the release of the game. J. C. Penny was the first retailer to launch a nationwide advertising campaign on television for a software title. Continuing a long-standing relationship between it and Sears, Atari also produced Pac-Man cartridges under the department store's label. So how was its reception? Well, anticipation for the game was high. Atari stated in 1981 that it had pre-orders for 3 or 4 million copies of the Atari 2600 version. Goldman Sachs analyst Richard Simon predicted the sale of 9 million units during 1982, which would yield a profit of $200 million. Pac-Man met with initial commercial success, selling 7 million copies and eventually becoming the best-selling Atari 2600 title. Fry reportedly received $0.1 in royalties per copy. More than 1 million of those cartridges had been shipped in less than one month, helped by Atari's $1.5 million publicity campaign. However, purchases soon slowed and, by the summer of 1982, unsold copies were available in large quantities. Many buyers returned the games for refunds, and Atari was left with 5 million excess copies in addition to the returns. By 2004, the cartridges were still very common among collectors and enthusiasts though the Sears versions were rarer and priced lower. At release, critics negatively compared the port to its original arcade form, panning the audiovisuals and gameplay. On May 11, 1982, Electronic Games magazine published its first bad review ever for an Atari video game, saying, Considering the anticipation and considerable time the Atari designers had to work on it, it's astonishing to see a home version of a classic arcade contest so devoid of what gave the original its charm. Video Magazine admitted it was challenging, and there are a few visual pluses. Before lamenting, unfortunately those who cannot evaluate Pac-Man through lovers' eyes are likely to be disappointed. The premier issue of video games player from fall 1982 called Pac-Man just awful. In 1983, 
creative computing video and arcade games reviewer Danny Goodman commented that the game fails as a replica of its arcade form. Atari stated clearly in its description of the cartridge that Atari's Pac-Man differs slightly from the original. That, perhaps, was an understatement. Conversely, he stated that such criticism was unfair because the hardware could not properly emulate the arcade game. Goodman further said that the port is a challenging maze game in its own right, and it would have been a success if fans had not expected to play a game closer to the original. That year Phil Wiswell of video games criticized the game's poor graphics, mockingly referring to it as Flickerman, while Softline questioned why Atari opposed Pac-Man clones when the 2600 version was less like the original than any of the pack of imitators. The game has remained poorly rated. In 1998, Next Generation magazine editors called it the worst coin-op conversion of all time and attributed the mass dissatisfaction to its poor quality. In 2006, IGN's Craig Harris echoed similar statements and listed it as the worst arcade conversion, citing poor audiovisuals that did not resemble the original. Another IGN editor, Levi Buchanan, described it as a disastrous port, citing the color scheme and flickering ghosts. Skyler Miller of all games said that although the game was only a passing resemblance to the original, it was charming despite its many differences and faults. Ed Logg, a former lead designer at Atari, who never programmed the VCS, considered the development a rushed, lousy effort. Fry did not express regret over his part in Pac-Man's port and felt he made the best decisions he could at the time. However, Fry stated that he would have done things differently with a larger capacity ROM. Video game industry researchers Nick Montfort and Ian Bogost attribute the poor reception to the technical differences between the 1977 Atari 2600 console and the 1980 arcade hardware used in Pac-Man cabinets. They further stated that the conversion is a lesson in maintaining the social and cultural context of the original source. Montfort and Bogost commented that players were disappointed with the flickering visual effect, which made the ghosts difficult to track and tired the players' eyes. The two further said that the effect diminishes the ghosts' personalities present in the arcade version. Chris Kohler of Wired commented that the game was poorly received upon its release and in contemporary times because of the poor quality. However, he further described the game as an impressive technical achievement given its console's limitations. What was the, the impact and legacy of this game? Initially, the excitement generated by Pac-Man's home release prompted retail stores to expand their inventory to sell video games. Drug stores began stocking video game cartridges, and toy retailers vied for new releases. Mutt and J.C. Penney competed against Sears to become the largest vendor of video games. The game's release also led to an increase in sales of the Atari 2600 console. In retrospect, however, critics often cite Atari's Pac-Man as a major factor in the drop of consumer confidence in the company, which contributed to the North American video game crash of 1983. Bill Lagidis and Matt Barton of Gama Sutra stated that the game's poor quality damaged the company's reputation. Buchanan commented that it disappointed millions of fans and diminished confidence in Atari's games. Former Next Generation Editor-in-Chief Neil West attributes his long-time skepticism of Atari's quality to the disappointment he had from buying the game as a child. Calling the game the top video game disaster, Buchanan credits Pac-Man as a factor to the downfall of Atari and the industry in the 1980s. Author Stephen Kent also blames the game, along with Atari's E.T. the Extraterrestrial, for severely damaging the company's reputation and profitability. Montfort and Bogost stated that the game's negative reception seeded mistrust in retailers, which was reinforced by later factors that culminated in the crash. Millions of unsold copies is one of many reasons that led to Atari's report of a $536 million loss in 1983 and the division and sale of the company's consumer division in 1984. On December 7, 1982, 
CASA announced that Atari's revenue forecasts for 1982 were cut from a 50% increase over 1981 to a 15% increase. Immediately following the announcement, Warner Communications' stock value dropped by around 35% from $54 to $35 amounting to a loss of $1.3 billion in the company's market valuation. Atari attempted to regain its market share by licensing popular arcade games for its consoles. The revenue from selling these console games did not reverse Atari's decline and the company went further into debt. In 1983, the company decreased its workforce by 30% and lost $356 million. In late 1982, Atari ported Pac-Man to its new console, the Atari 5200. This version was a more accurate conversion of the original arcade game and was a launch title for the console, along with 11 other games. The port was also followed by conversions of Pac-Man's arcade sequels, Miss Pac-Man and Junior Pac-Man, for the Atari 2600. Both were better received than Atari's first Pac-Man title and addressed many critics' complaints of Pac-Man, but at the cost of excluding a two-player mode and requiring larger ROM cartridges. Well that's all I had to say for Atari's 1981 Pac-Man. If you hate or like this video and came to the end of it then it would seem you will be better off subscribing to Kimmer's Gaming.